wonderful. And um, Jalen, what's your, I don't know the answer to this. What is your original instrument and how did you get into conducting? Uh, my my so is a little long winded, so I'll try and keep it as concise as possible. But uh, my instrument was a percussionist or percussion. Um, but uh, a important distinction in the in the drum whacking world is between a percussionist and drummer. And I really didn't start off as a percussionist in in the strictest form of the word. In in the strictest form of the word, um, I didn't take up music seriously until I was about eighteen or nineteen. Um, I came from a very science uh, heavy family and that, that was our focus and music was just this wonderful yet mysterious world that was never really explored. But I grew up drumming in, in rock bands and jazz bands and playing in, in bars and that type of thing. And when I started to discover classical music, um, it was a transition into the world of formal orchestral percussion. And I was lucky to have pursued that to a fairly high level. Um, but through that, I was also very big on composition. Uh, started out as songwriting and then started to write more classical music um, and that led to a lot of opportunities of putting ensembles together um, to uh, read and perform some of my own works which then became other people's works which then became larger <laughs> ensembles which then eventually led to orchestral conducting um, and then from there the rest has just been uh, as Jonathan said a very uh, bizarre but fascinating and wonderful world of, of conducting since and um, one of your mentors is, um, I believe, is Dr. Gerard. Is he a mentor of yours? Yes, uh, Dr. Gerard was, uh, he's the um, uh, professor of conducting and director of orchestras at the University of British Columbia. And uh, I, I often wonder with the experience that I had when I started my master's degree with him in orchestral conducting, uh, why he would take a chance <laughs> on someone like me. But I was very lucky that uh, he took me under his wing, so to say, and uh, still remains a mentor and a friend um, to the state. That's wonderful and I'm looking forward to our podcast um, where we can branch off a bit and talk about band leading and arranging and all things jazz because um, you know my, my friends can tell you that in the last year I've been pushing classical away a little bit never completely um, but I've been listening and playing a lot more jazz and singing a lot more jazz on my own time and um, discovering what a wonderful world that is. No pun intended to Louis Armstrong. Uh, that just came out. <laughs> but um, I look forward to that because that is something really unique um, and a unique experience. Finalement, nous arrivons à Adam à Montréal. Adam, what's your, your instrument is piano. That's right, yes. So I did start on piano in high school. I played trombone and tuba and uh, actually a little jazz link as well. I played drums in the jazz band. and. Um, and so, but then I really, once I got to university level, really focused in on piano. Uh, but when I was, I mean, I grew up in a small town, Hinton, Alberta, and um, I wasn't all that serious about my music studies when I was younger. But then the, a couple of things happened uh, when I was 16 years old. One was that I heard a recording of Vladimir Horowitz, and that opened my mind to, you know, the possibilities on the piano, and I became... Uh, very obsessed with becoming a better pianist. And then also the Edmonton Symphony Orchestra did an outreach concert to Hinton, which uh, to this day is impressive to me because Hinton is a three hour drive mm -hmm. from Edmonton. And so for them to send the orchestra out, we didn't even have, um, we, we didn't even have a, a concert hall. We had a movie theater that had a stage um, that could allow some performing on it and so the Edmonton Symphony came and it just completely changed uh, my world. Uh, to see grown men and women playing the violin uh, for a living, I thought you had to be a, a doctor or a lawyer or a school teacher or you know these types of things and I went wow uh, you know that if there's anything that I could choose to do it would be to be involved uh, with that. Um, but similarly I was uh, I was given the advice that I'd better become a good pianist first before heading towards conducting. And so I, I spent a lot of years uh, with my piano studies. I ended up doing a doctorate. And um, once I'd started my doctoral studies, I also was doing formal conducting studies. And um, yeah, interestingly, my first job ended up being back in Alberta with the Calgary Philharmonic. Yes. Uh, I did that for three years before winning the job with the Montreal Symphony Orchestra. I, re I remember that you got the job in Calgary. Um, that's, you know, that's a wonderful, um, wonderful community as well. And um, mm -hmm. it is, yeah. 
the Edmonton Symphony Orchestra is the first symphony I heard too. <laughs> really? Um, yeah, I moved from Red Deer. Um, all these small prairie towns, well, not towns, but cities. Um, and I moved to Edmonton for undergrad in 2018, not 2018. I wish I was that young. 2001, I don't know. I am, time has stopped in COVID. Let's just say that. <laughs> in 2001, yeah. I, I was 18 and I moved to Edmonton for undergrad at U of A. And um, my best friend was a flautist. Um, okay. She's now an ophthalmologist. So Beatrice, if you're listening in Terrace, BC, I hope you're taking the day off from your patients. Um, and she was a flautist and she dragged me to the symphony because she said, enough solo piano recitals, you're boring. I was like, oh, fine. And so we went to the symphony. Um, she still thinks solo piano is boring. Um, she just wasn't the right, the right people. Um, <laughs> maybe she's yeah. right, I don't know. Um, and it was at the Windspear. And of course the Windspear Center is acoustically a gem, just like mm -hmm. the Japan Center, designed by the same person. And um, Yeah, and actually when I started my bachelor's, it was in Edmonton, and okay. the Windspear Center had just been built in 1998, and uh, it was around when I had moved there. So I was an usher, because I was just trying to get around the orchestra as much as I possibly could. <laughs> and, uh, and so I was an usher, mostly so I could try to check out concerts um, as often as possible. And then it was, uh, it was really special when I got to start uh, working with them professionally as a, as a guest conductor and I've been lucky to, to work with them quite a bit at this point now. So That's amazing. Um, so we have quite a few Canadian connections here, um, but Jonathan has joined us from the UK and I'm going to throw our first tough question at him because I'm doing some reading in Canada and have friends in orchestras and you know we're kind of getting more information about Canada, about how people are dealing with um, arts organizations are faced with what do we do about diversity. The last four weeks in the United States have brought to our attention um, some real injustice, some real inequality. And, you know, Muse West Concerts made a very quick statement very early on. Um, and we're working with our board of directors to make a really complete document highlighting our steps. Um, and I know that there is racial diversity in the UK. There's, there's a lot of it, especially in urban areas. And Jonathan, I'm wondering what you're seeing on your side of the pond for how orchestras are going to engage with this question. Absolutely. I mean, um, so two, two years back, I held a position at the City of Birmingham Symphony Orchestra, where I think I've always been on the forefront of asking this question already. Um, of, um, of course, times like this bring the question back to the back to the front of our mind, which is exceptionally important. Um, and it was wonderful to be around an organization like that. It was commissioning works from people from all sorts of different backgrounds, but also focusing, which I think is very important on its locality and the diversity in the city of Birmingham. Um, the thing, one of the projects that for me has been a through line from my cello life to my conducting life is uh, a little chamber music festival or predominantly chamber music festival that I run back home in, the northeast of England, I always felt it was very important to kind of give back to the region that sent me off on the journey, which was all by chance and huge amounts of luck. And so my little festival, Northern Chords, has always acknowledged that in the northeast of England, that there are lots of exceptionally, um, there are poorer areas and areas of where, you know, people from all sorts of different diverse backgrounds don't have at the educational level, at school level, uh, access um, to classical music or access to art and creativity and, and where schools might not necessarily focus on and, and bringing that in um, to their curriculum. And so as, as a festival, we've always and will continue to look at, um, at really working at the grassroots levels, I think, and, and bringing um, and yeah, giving as many opportunities, I think, from an educational point of view. I think that's really key. I think, of course, orchestras and music directors that can, that can program and uh, look from the top down too, I think is essential. But I think actually you one needs to start as, um, as early as possible to make everyone feel as, as they should do, as welcome as possible in this amazing art form. And it also has to start, like, who's on the board of governors? Is it all Caucasian males? with a certain income and education level, who are the voices at the top? Um, and I, you know, people have said to me, Muse West Concerts Board is like the youngest board of directors ever. And it might actually be true, they're all really young. Um, 
and they come from a diverse background, but I, I, I still, you know, I, I've been thinking about that too. And, um, you know, whose indigenous voices do we have? And, um, that that's a struggle that we're going through as well. Um, Adam, what have you seen, um, in, in Eastern Canada? What, what's the conversation like there about diversity and programming? Yeah, there's certainly, I mean, it is a very big topic and uh, a project that I was really lucky to be involved with, with the Montreal Symphony Orchestra was the commissioning of a new opera called Shakapesh, uh, which took um, Indigenous themes, uh, legends, and uh, it was a, an opera sung in Cree, mm. but that had text uh, that could be done in several different uh, Native dialects. And the orchestra, then there was a, a larger it was a chamber opera essentially, but it could be done in different configurations uh, because then the orchestra took it on tour up into the Northern communities in Quebec, uh, where like really far, a couple hours flight North kind of thing. Um, and uh, where these people have, you know, pretty much never had access to orchestral music. And then to be able to um, have an orchestra perform in music that's about their legends and in mm. their native tongue and incorporated for each, the opera also allowed for uh, performances from people from the area uh, to be incorporated into it. And so it was, I thought a really, uh, a really wonderful project that had a big impact. And we, you know, we had uh, Inuit throat singing uh, in it and uh -huh. things like this, that um, it was really, you know, something that was a wonderful combination, uh, a wonderful dialogue uh, that was created through that. And a film was made uh, of the process. So now that film uh, is being shown in, in theaters and as, as a documentary on TV. And so it's getting a lot of exposure that way. And, and so that's, uh, I think, one notable project. I think Andrew sent me pictures of that trip. Um, Andrew won. Uh, concert master of the OSM, longtime friend of mine. Um, he had sent me some pictures. He said, oh, sorry, we didn't have Wi-Fi. We were in the north. Yeah, <laughs> and he's like, look at me. It's like being in Edmonton again, but even colder. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> there, was, there was definitely, um, I remember that. And um, I think that that trip had a big impact on him and Brian. Mm -hmm. Yes, it was it was impactful for everybody involved. It was really, yeah. really special. And just the way that the uh, orchestra was welcomed by each community as well and to, to be able to partake in, in ceremonies and they were, you know, it just was a, a really wonderful human experience. For sure. Now, Jalen, did you grow up in the Vancouver area? Mm -hmm. Yes, born and raised. Richmond to be specific, but uh, Vancouver for uh, anyone who's not familiar. <laughs> now, how is um, how is Symphony Twenty One going to engage with diversity? I know that in your orchestra you have a wide background of folks. I haven't been able to make a show yet because they've conflicted with school nights and marking and um, report cards. But um, I've been watching the videos, and Paul and Kristen have been sending me pictures, and um, you're choosing some amazing venues too. Are you planning on commissioning or projects like that? We we have a few plans that, uh, of course, COVID has has really uh, derailed. I think as it has for everyone, uh, the bigger projects just because budgets and and audience and venues are so up in the air. And before you make um, big projects like commissions happen, there needs to be certain things in place. But um, assuming that we do go ahead with um, a few performances from our next season, uh, we've really been having a conversation over the last year and into the season about uh, what music we're performing, um, who's it by and who's able to attend and listen to it. Um, one big thing in our venue choices is, is focusing on um, removing elements of the aesthetic of what orchestral music has traditionally been. Um, so trying to uh, dress down, if you will, trying to, to take away elements of stage versus audience or the us and them, um, having in the round seating, very intimate um, venues where people can really engage with audience and performers. Um, one hallmark of, of, of our concerts is um, not having anyone, not having anyone stand for for me when I walk out, and not having uh, maybe a separate backstage area, but allowing audience members to just approach our players and ask questions. Um, 
mm. by having that kind of accessibility in areas of the city, which may not have been uh, as privileged as other areas of Vancouver, the Lower Mainland, um, allowing that free and open questioning of someone with an oboe and asking, oh, this is a funny looking clarinet, and uh, being able to engage in those, in those conversations. Um, two big premieres that we're looking for, Canadian premieres that we're looking forward to, um, are uh, of two uh, female composers, which I've really been wanting to champion for a long time. One, Louise Franck, who is a, a French composer and will be doing the Canadian premiere of her third symphony, as well as the um, Canadian premiere of the orchestration of Rebecca Clark's viola uh, sonata, originally oh. for viola and piano, but orchestrated by a wonderful American arranger um, named Ruth Lohman. Um, Pre-COVID, the plan was for her to come up and do a whole pre-concert chat about it and talk about the process of really discovering Rebecca Clark's music and bringing it to life. Um, we're hoping to engage with her uh, over the internet or over Zoom uh, and still premiere that with a wonderful violist from Vancouver uh, by the name of Carolyn Olson. Um, so those are our two big plans, but always engaging in the conversation and revisiting um, who is this music for, who are we trying to reach with it, um, whose voices are we really promoting and is there a way that we can keep um, expanding who we're reaching through those choices. Mm -hmm. um, and I'll turn to Naomi. Um, I, I know that syst for Sistema Winnipeg, I mean, this work is the forefront of what you're doing. Um, How is the symphony engaging with this? Definitely. Well, you know, I think something that's really important for all of us is to also move the conversation beyond diversity. Because I think what the language of diversity does is it suggests that the problem is just representation. It's just who. Um, but actually, I think when we move the conversation past that, we can also really engage with questions of accessibility, like Jayla mentioned. So, mm -hmm. so, you know, are our buildings accessible to people? Is our material captioned? You know, can people who have different kinds of disabilities access our material? Um, and then beyond even the questions of access, I think then that brings us into questions of inclusion um, and in questions of equity. So it's one thing to get people in the door or welcome them in the door, but when they're there, like Jalen was saying too, do they feel welcome? Does it feel like a space for them? Does it feel like a space for me? And then also, how is this work actively engaging in making a more equitable world as well? And I think that's one of the questions to, to really keep reconciling with. And I think when we frame the question a bit bigger, what, what can end up happening is being less focused on a final product, less focused on saying, okay, We've done it, here's the piece, here's the female composer, here's the indigenous composer, done. And more focused on creating a process in which everyone is more welcome and more included. There's a, there's a theorist called Sarah Ahmed, whose work I really like, and she uses this story about a post box. And the post box story is that if you have a post box that says, birds welcome, you can put a sign on it and say birds welcome, but if people are still using the post box to put their mail in and out of, the birds aren't gonna come and make a nest in the post box because the post box is still being used for other things. It's not hospitable to the birds, even though they're theoretically welcome there. Um, and maybe they could even fly in, but they'll probably leave the next time mail goes in. So actually in order to make birds really welcome, you have to put a sign on the post box that says, do not use birds nesting. Then people stop using the post box in their normal ways and allow it to be used in a new way. And so I think something I'm really thinking about is what do we, not just what we do, but also what do we stop doing, right? How do we actually actively change how things are and actively take certain things away in order to change how equitable our society is, how equitable our industry is, and who's involved? So those are the questions I'm grappling with. Those are huge questions, and um, you know, the, I've I've been thinking about those too. And um, sorry, <laughs> um, I thought I turned off all phone calls. Um, what I've what I found is that um, that is what we're grappling with too, as Chamber Music Society. Is um, how do you 
how do you engage with people and get past some stereotypes that you have to be dressed a certain way to come to our concerts? And I want to give props to Jalem and Symphony 21 because I've seen that you're at Ironworks mm -hmm. um, and that that's like sort of a jazz live music venue slash sort of bar in like the downtown east side. Um, totally flexible seating, like you said. All of those small elements can make a really big difference. Um, so that is a wonderful portion of our conversation. And I'm going to ask my board members to review that section and be like, okay, it's brainstorming time. <laughs> well, I mean, in that first concert that you referred to, which was at Railtown, um, which when people in Canada talk about the opioid crisis, and especially in BC, they often refer to it as an intersection on the downtown east side of Vancouver, of Maine and Hastings as the real epicenter. Um, and this venue that we chose was about four blocks east from that intersection. And this was our first concert as an organization. And uh, there were quite a few uh, questions about whether I'd lost my mind and whether this was really a good idea, who would come. Um, but one of the most <clears throat> powerful moments from that, uh, and I should clarify that many people didn't like it and that, you know, um, it's a conversation that I think everyone is allowed to have their own um, feelings about it, but when it comes to classical music in a concert hall, there's so many great orchestras all over the world that are that are doing concerts in 3,000 seat venues, and that's wonderful. I mean, that's what I fell in love with too. Um, but one of the most powerful things from that Railtown concert, where it was an old textile building, mm -hmm. um, and uh, before the concert, there was a whole cleaning crew for three hours dealing with some of the less savory elements of the building. But uh, at the end of the night, we we had a homeless gentleman. Um, uh, stop by for the concert uh, for the second half, which was Mozart 40. Um, and uh, he he sat there for the entire symphony and afterwards came up to uh, one of our board members and was just discussing how human he felt um, being part of being part of an artistic experience, um, mm -hmm. being treated like he was meant to be there um, and that he didn't need to know what was being performed. He didn't need to know what the event was. He didn't need to know anything about Symphony 21 or who I was or who was performing or, or, or anything. All that mattered was the sound that was being made and how uh, human he felt uh, because of that experience. And that's, you know, performing symphony, symphonic works in found venues is, is tough for sure. <laughs> it would be so much easier to rent a theater and just, just go that route. Um, but it's really one of the mandates that, as Naomi was was alluding to, something that I really believe strongly in and is a big part of the conversation of finding a way to um, be creative in getting over some of those barriers. That's very inspiring. Um, and I feel like even just starting that conversation is a big step forward. Um, you know, I, I love going to the Met in New York. Um, Anybody that has me on Instagram will know that. <laughs> and I love Jonathan and Naomi, they know. Um, and I loved going to the Concert Cabal in Amsterdam. And um, I love attending concerts at the Chan. And I, you know, it's, it's a thrill to go to David Geffen Hall and hear the New York Phil and Walt Disney Hall. Th this is great, but it's not, it's not the end of the story. And of course, the Maison Symphonique in Montreal is, I mean, it is such a special place. Um, it's the first place I got to hear Maxim Bengarov play. Um, mm. And he played the concert solos for Rimsky Korsakov Scheherazade. And I think that's the first time I really knew like, oh wow, that is just, is such a special experience. Um, being there in Montreal and seeing my friend like sitting at first desk beside Bengarov and it was uh, unreal. But also like when you mentioned that person felt human, that is, that's extraordinary. And that's what this art is designed to do. Um, we have a few minutes left in our chat and we'll have a little lighter question now. What music do you want to program pre or post COVID? Once this is all over, what do you want to program for people? And we'll start with Naomi. And I didn't, that's a harder question. <laughs> um, you know, maybe, maybe I'll flip the question again because I can't answer your questions. Um, but, uh, but I think the thing I'm really thinking about as a conductor right now is who am I connecting, you know, and I think that's really what our job is, right, as conductors is we're connecting players on stage with each other and, you know, 
unifying all of their like incredible musical talents and ideas. And we're connecting those players with people in the audience who are not playing. And so, you know, I don't know when the next time I'll conduct on a stage is. Genuinely, I don't know. Um, but when I do, I really want to be thinking about who is it that I'm connecting and why? And what are those, what am I going to bring together? And what are those people going to get out of being brought together and feeling that human connection with each other? And to me, that is just so much more important and exciting than what repertoire it is that I do that through. What a thoughtful answer. <laughs> That's wonderful. Adam, what do you want to conduct? What do you want to program once this is all over? Like you well, you know, I, I see, well, you know, and I think it'll be, who knows when it, it'll be completely over, but with this, uh, you know, these little baby steps uh, happening, I, it's a wonderful opportunity for smaller ensemble things, right? That often gets in these great halls and uh, in these large symphony orchestra contexts, I mean, the bigger is better often, right? And and uh, we've been doing a lot of Mahler and these massive impressive things. And um, whereas Mozart symphonies have kind of gotten relegated to uh, performance practice specialists uh, largely. And, you know, so there's just a lot of these uh, wonderful earlier repertoire uh, that can be explored and well, or rebrought to, you know, a new focus. And it's kind of got a, a, an opportunity to shine, I think. Um, and I have to say, as I just did a programming exercise, actually, as part of a, there's a music director search that I'm part of. And, and um, with this uh, diversity question going on, I have been researching things that I've been discovering, like uh, the Florence Price uh, concerto in one movement. Is a, is a 20 minute piano concerto. That's great. I mean, audiences would, would love this piece. And uh, there's some jazz elements in it and there's some really powerful music making. And it's a great piece, regardless of that it's a female African-American uh, composer. Um, so, you know, it's been, it's been a neat opportunity to, to try and explore some things, but, uh, you know, it's wonderful to, to discover that, well, it's not just because it's the topic of our times uh, currently, but that there really genuinely is amazing music uh, waiting to get discovered. So it's been a fun process. Hmm, wonderful. Jonathan, um, let's imagine that they found a vaccine, uh, the world is healed, <laughs> 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 or you have, you know, a hall, a hall to capacity, or maybe you're imagining something like a smaller hall, smaller ensemble, um, sort of more staggered seating. What do you want to program once this is all over? I suppose, again, it's quite a tricky question to answer. I don't know how everyone else feels about right now. So often I don't actually have that much choice about some of the content, what's going into certain concerts. So I, technically I know what piece, the next concert I have that's not yet been cancelled um, is Elgar and Ingo Variations in Berlin in September. So wow. maybe it will happen, maybe it won't, who knows. Um, Having said that, um, I was just before this call talking um, with a composer friend who's just been given a grant um, to, uh, where she needs to find a commissioning body to um, work with him in the next three weeks that we need to make a decision about in three weeks. And so we were just discussing the possibility of, of not, not um, commissioning a piece that was designed for social distancing, but perhaps a piece that's designed for using this space. So by accident, social distancing, so that it has a, a life beyond its first performance with so many commissions I'm sure we all know tend to so often unfortunately get just paid once and so my friend Pratch and I were just discussing maybe we could if, if, if things work out um, and we can put our heads together in the next few weeks maybe commissioning a piece that is of our time as a response to, to what's going on and at the same time as Adam was saying I think it's a great chance to look at smaller uh, scale things so actually uh, it's a program not until autumn next year but I just discovered the composer uh, Josef Martin Krauss uh, who, uh, born in Germany, was, worked at the Swedish court, basically the same date as Mozart, was kind of coined the Swedish Mozart. And he wrote some absolutely fantastic small symphonies. And so in, in a program alongside things like the Mozart clarinet concerto, I've suggested, I don't know if the orchestra's accepted it yet, but um, some of these lesser known classical composers, as well as using, you know, we're obviously using lesser um, known composers up to date too. So yeah, three little answers to the question.
Wonderful. No one has said for Claire to knock yet. I'm waiting. <laughs> well, a, couple uh, of other, a couple of other little Mozart contemporaries that I really think everybody should be listening to and checking out are Chevalier de Saint-Georges or, or Joseph Boulogne, who incredible little symphonies, and also very slightly earlier, but the Spanish composer Mariana Martinez, um, who has these absolutely wonderful keyboard concertos. Adam, you might in particular be interested in the other yeah. keyboard. But they're they're absolutely like just delightful. Um, so just some other things to to look out for in terms yeah. of the small scale older music. That's wonderful. And we'll wrap that question up with Jalem. What um, what would you like to program once this is all done? What would bring people encouragement and what would be allowed? I mean, I think of all the people we're talking to, probably where Jalem and I live right now is maybe well actually Manitoba is probably doing the best with the whole COVID thing, um, but. We're, we're, we're right behind you in British Columbia. We're doing pretty well for a high population. And I know Quebec has had some pretty big struggles and the UK has had some struggles as well. Um, so, you know, there's a chance that um, Naomi and Jalen could program something a bit more ambitious sooner. Um, but Jonathan, you talked about Germany. They're doing quite well. Um, so your concert in Berlin might not be so far off. <laughs> Fingers crossed. But Jalen, what would you program? Huh. I was hoping I wouldn't go last so that <laughs> everyone's answers was much better than <laughs> mine. Um, I mean, with with my concerts lined up, we're, we're, we've programmed about uh, five concerts worth of small um, small works. So we have we have a Haydn symphony alongside the Louise Falanc work that I was speaking of. Um, we have a, a fairly small performance back to size orchestra of Beethoven three, a few string orchestra works to get us started, hopefully in August right now, uh, unless something dramatically changes. We'll be doing a program of George Walker's Lyric for Strings alongside jo Jocelyn Morlock's um, Nostalgia for Strings. So trying to keep it fairly small, um, uh, instrumentalists who can wear masks, um, spreading out, going the more live stream digital um, spread out audiences. That being said, if there was magically a vaccine found tomorrow and we were just allowed to do whatever we want <laughs> as, as artists, um, I think I would kind of build on what I, uh, Jonathan was saying and go towards the new music uh, world. Um, and one of my crazy ideas would be to commission um, an entire concert of new music that's reflective of um, the times that we've been living through and you do a concert that's completely wholly representative of, of what the whole world has been going through. Um, and I would love to pair that with like a multimedia disciplinary, multidisciplinary approach of maybe including all of these different video projects that people have been um, sharing on social media. Um, there's been so many creative, you know, TikTok videos, Instagram videos, um, little, you know, uh, memes or, or whatever you have that have just really, I think, summarized what we've all been going through and finding a way to be interdisciplinary and maybe combining some form of visual mediums with new music as a way to uh, speak to uh, recent times, I think would be a really powerful concert. And um, I've just been, as we wrap this up, I've just been reflecting on how um, initially, I was in shell shock over this whole situation of COVID. I was meant to be in Bergamo in Northern Italy <laughs> for all of spring break <laughs> um, <laughs> to see my best friend. And um, that was quickly very much off the table. Um, she's now coming to Canada in July because she's a permanent resident. And actually, this is the only country she can visit um, other than the European Union. So that worked out kind of okay. But I don't think my sadness really sunk in until May because April was like, get my grade five class online, get my piano students online. There was no time to be sad. Um, so that all got pushed down. And then I started listening to choir videos <laughs> and that was not a good idea because I would just start crying because I, I missed hearing choirs. Um, I missed attending like my faith community and I realized holy doodle, when is the next time I'm going to hear an orchestra? When will I listen to a live opera? Um, you know, my friend had invited me to um, the, the Met in, in the fall, and another friend has um, a debut at Carnegie. Um, Naomi knows him. It's Larry from Yale. 
and I was invited to that and there's so many things I was looking forward to, but um, we've been coming up with creative solutions. And if the Toronto Symphony is listening or Jonathan Crow is listening or Hugo Lee, you guys have been doing such a great job with your videos. I think the editing from the Toronto Symphony has just been unreal. They recently had James Ennis doing the Beethoven Romance. So there's been such creativity and such encouragement. Um, at this point, I don't want to keep our participants from, from their day too much longer. You've been so generous with your time. Um, Jalen, it's nice to meet you. Naomi and Jonathan and Adam, you are very much missed and hope to see you in person very soon. Um, Jonathan, maybe it'll be at the concert, Gabo. <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> Who knows? Um, so it was so great of you all to, to um, share your time with us today. So thank you so much. and. Um, we wish you all the best and please keep us informed about your activities and we will let our audience know all of your new upcoming projects. Thank you for having us. Yes, <laughs> Thanks, thank you. everybody. And happy Father's Day to everybody. Happy Father's Day to all the dads and to Papa <laughs> Hayden. <laughs> Great to meet everyone. <laughs> Thanks everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.